I really feel that we are the captains of an amazing ship. Uh, we're going to take our cities to places they should have been all along. And uh, this is only meant to be a tip of the iceberg kind of a presentation. But I truly feel that we have to fall in love with our cities again if we're going to build them right. Because there's so much that we're going against the tide on. So in this uh, presentation, I'm going to talk first and foremost about walkability, what it is, and then what multimodal transportation is. And I realize I'm speaking to the choir, but I think it's also important that we come up with a common vocabulary for everything we do. I'm um, delightful that this conference is discussing the importance of land use, but I have a little bit I want to cover. Likewise with the economics of cities. Uh, our cities are going to go bankrupt if we don't start building them the right way, and that's for people and place. And stop pampering the car. And uh, then uh, placemaking, and with placemaking, health and social cohesion. Uh, this is uh, lacking in America, and we need it back. A complete streets, which is streets for all, target speed, vision zero, and then how do we bring about the change? So that's a lot to cover, but uh, as long as we set good bearings and follow the right pathway, we will be building our cities for everyone, not just for some, and not just for those who happen to have an automobile, but anyone could easily switch out their mode. I think it's important uh, to bring back nature to our cities. Uh, there's some good examples of that, and uh, also, to get back to the most basic town-making principles. These are long established. For tens of thousands of years, we've been building cities correctly. It's only in the last 100 years we stopped building cities correctly. So I'll use this as an example. I was uh, taking a series of walks, and I got bumped out of sidewalks, I think it was a total of nine times, because they didn't orchestrate the new construction correctly, and there was no place for me to walk. Uh, they wanted me to cross over, I think it was seven lanes in this case, but I noticed no one else was doing that. And so we need to pay attention to those basics, right? And if we're going to build for people, we need to think about every type of decision in our city in order uh, to make it work. So where do we begin? And from the panel discussion this morning, I, uh, the word I picked up on, and I emphasize in all of my work, is we've got to get back to our values. If we build for the things we care about, for families, for wholesomeness, for the future, then we're going to get the design right. But if we keep building, again, overbuilding for the car, we're going to keep the pedestrian at hostage. We will not be honoring our elders. And so all of this means that we just focus on values first, and then that'll give us the right direction. I also like to point out that when you plan cities for cars and traffic, you're going to get more cars and more traffic. It's been proven 60, even 80 years in some places that designing for the car only means you're going to get more cars because you're making people more dependent. But if you plan your cities for people in place, you're going to get more people and more place, places you're proud of. So let's start with the first big uh, bucket, multimodal communities. Uh, and essentially, I feel this image captures what that's all about, that you could easily change from one mode to another in the same hour, certainly in the same day. And you're going to have more fun if you're not trapped um, where you're being forced uh, to uh, be riding alone and so on. And uh, uh, Utah is doing an amazing job with transit. It's one of my favorite places to study with your bus rapid transit, your light rail systems. Uh, you guys have broken all the records for, for doing it right. And obviously, you'll do it more. I got to ride your transit uh, yesterday and a little bit the day before. But what multimodal communities are all about is also putting the right buildings in place. And as you'll see when I get to my land use section, 
getting the right land use combinations so that it all works together. And when you do that, then people aren't gonna have to travel as far. And uh, when they get to the places they want, they're going to feel rewarded by the places that were built. So another term that's being used uh, widely in uh, Utah is streets for all. Uh, whether we're talking about users or, or uh, uses, uh, others in other states are using the term complete streets. I know you know both languages, right? But in this case, take a look at the image. The buildings on the left are mostly industrial buildings. And um, they narrowed the lanes down to 10 feet, which is my preferred starting point. And then they put in a buffer uh, to the sidewalk with a bike lane. That creates great comfort for the pedestrian. But because the utilities are on that side, all the green had to be on the right-hand side, but that's where the housing is. So a street that's designed correctly takes a look at both sides of the street, and in many cases, each block. So there's no such thing as a design of a street for all users. And then we start with the most basic. If we, uh, I had the stage, if you look at the gentleman on the on the left image, um, that's not a lot of comfort for walking. I mean, you've got a place you can walk. It's even wide enough. But look how much easier it is to walk in the scene on the right. So during one of my walks in uh, Salt Lake, uh, this is one of my favorite streets. It uh, has pretty ample width for the walk. The buildings watch over the street. It's nicely shaded and then you've got a protected bike lane, and then the cars further uh, uh, leave a huge separation from moving cars to the uh, area of walking, 27 feet. That's really well done. And there are many places in Salt Lake I saw that quality of, of walk being offered. I want to talk a little bit about how health and social engagement fit. These are real pictures. Uh, people taking an escalator to their fitness center and people walking their dog in the town where I was born, in Columbus, Ohio, on a leash, right, out of a car. I work for an organization uh, known as Blue Zones. Uh, look us up on the internet. We now work in over 100 cities and the principle of the, uh, the uh, organization is build cities so that walking becomes the natural activity again. And uh, this is Dan Butner. He now has five uh, books and cover stories for National Geographic. And uh, uh, again, he's the third most read uh, writer in National Geographic's history because people want to know about health. I like to uh, use just one image to, to express, express this. Uh, essentially, we are in control of how long and how healthy we live. 70% uh, is up to us. It's not up to our genetics. Genetics play a role, but it's not the key role. Uh, again, we can change all this and then work to um, increase our access to health care. That's 80%. That's the whole idea behind Blue Zones is to give people, to empower people. Uh, to be able to do these things. I think it's also important to point out that when we uh, shape cities correctly, the cities then shape us. So walking, social engagement, how many friends we have, everything is dependent on what we design. What is our nest like, right? Uh, we design th that area, and each city can and will do it. So uh, on our walks, we're leading one more uh, yet today. Uh, we always emphasize security, number one. People aren't gonna walk if it's not secure or if it doesn't feel secure. Things need to be convenient. I'll get into that in the land use. Uh, things need to work. Uh, they need to be efficient. And this is especially true for walking and biking. We have to get across the street, right? Um, things have to be comfortable. That's too often left out, especially when we talk about safety if you don't have comfort, you're not going to have enough people walking where the pedestrian becomes routine, 
enough that the motor starts to form that as a signature, right? And then, of course, make the pedestrians feel welcome, as Walt Disney did on his Main Street, which is, by the way, designed after Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, his architect was from Fort Collins. And many of the scenes I see here on Center Street uh, are, are truly compatible with, with uh, Fort Collins treatment of, like you're parking in the center, right? Things like that. Okay, let's talk about placemaking. Placemaking is its own unique art. It's where people want to go. And um, my hope and my love is uh, to find people that are gonna create the great next places in America. The ones that get written about, that novels and uh, articles capture. Um, and each one should be unique to where you are. Uh, the elements of a great place are in this little plaza in San Juan, Puerto Rico, but it's, it feels like San Juan, per Puerto Rico. Uh, or Salt Lake, is, is this Greek town? Help me out, Heather. Okay, good. I, I fell in love with it and uh, went back and walked it a second time and a, a, a third time if I have time. And these are, these are genuinely well-contained, properly designed places. Every place can still be better, but we need a good starting point. And so the walks I took in Salt Lake uh, gave me a touch point, a beginning point. And then on each street that I found thereafter, I said, is this carrying forth the right principles? Uh, but there's got to be a lot of love in these wonderfully built and crafted places in Salt Lake. But I'm gonna quickly go through some of the others. Uh, Manhattan, this used to be an ugly waterfront. And um, another waterfront, but then a much smaller town, Fort Pierce. Uh, this got totally devastated by a hurricane and they rebuilt it uh, because it was their centerpiece for their community. We can also do it by envisioning the future with photomorphs. Uh, so we take a look at a place and then we imagine what it could be or should be if we're going to reinvent this entire neighborhood, you start with the intersections, right? Um, I love taking walks in London. I think I've now walked all of London, um, but I'm especially enamored the streets they've remade, they've repurposed, they've rebuilt. Uh, or even small cities like Durango. Uh, imagine what this would be if that was a parking lot out in front. Uh, this is a, a uh, grocer who actually figured that out. This used to be a parking lot. And he says, I don't need more parking. I need more people. And so he took the parking lot, transformed it into a people place, and he has become one of the most successful uh, stores in all of North Carolina uh, by figuring that out. So let's do a little uh, quick uh, vision here. Is this a walkable place? What would you add? Sidewalks, crossings. It still doesn't feel right, so you add green. Still doesn't feel right, what would you add? This is the most important. Eyes on the park, eyes on the plaza. Now, uh, I think almost any parent would feel really good about their child walking to a friend's house, but not the way it was, right? Or likewise, we can do that with a building. This building uh, dishonors the street. And in the city, that's acceptable. Um, but what if you took that wall away, on the front at least, and then put in elements of place, and then edges? We're going to talk about that in more depth in just a minute. A good friend of mine um, bought an entire block in uh, South Beach and reinvented it. She went from a $150,000 investment she walked away with $15 million. Three blocks that she helped reinvent. And she had to, very little money she had to put into it, but she had to create place, identity, character. This feels like South Beach. Uh, children uh, need to play, but they need to play on their own. Not in some sports or something like that. They need to be able to go out and just do a pickup game, right? So this housing uh, creates the enclosure for this little park area 
uh, in uh, Petaluma, and kids can play right there within sight of their parents. Um, and in, this is affordable housing to the right, right next to market-driven housing. We need to mix housing together. So now let's get into the heart of the uh, land use. And um, I'm gonna talk first about the level of connectivity. We should be measuring our success on uh, how well connected, how easy it is, how accessible it is to get from one place to another. So looking at the comparison between how many nodes and links is a very important measure. But if you do this, it's easier to walk, but there's no reason to walk. So you have to build in the destinations. And this is when we talk about a 15 minute neighborhood, this is what we're talking about. So we need permission to put uh, parks and uh, urban spaces, stores, schools, everything in these uh, radii, right? So the 15 minute city looks like this, but really truly you put the most important elements at the core. And then you go out one ring and you put some other elements that you weren't able to get into the heart, but they're close enough that people can walk to it, bike to it, not have to drive, and go out um, with that concept. I like to do it from uh, parks alone. Uh, I started out as a parks planner, and uh, the, the, the Victorian standard, Victoria, Australia, is that they want a park or a place for people to go to within an eighth mile of every home. So as planners, think about that. Uh, draw a radius from each of your public spaces and see whether you're eighth of a mile, quarter mile, half mile, or two miles, right? And then change your rules and get it right. I was able to design this community for a developer, and I put in the added connectivity uh, that you see to the right because I knew he was going to build another neighborhood there. And you don't want people to driving out to a principal street just to come back in to visit a friend in the adjacent neighborhood. But it's the area on the left I wanna talk about. We started with 14 units per acre, 14 housing units per acre. And I'm sad to say it was a conservation group, a land conservation group that came in and said, we won't accept that. So they knocked it down to nine units per acre. And then finally to seven units per acre. We had to give up the park. The city had to pay for the cost of building the park and maintaining the park because we couldn't get enough rooftops into the neighborhood. So density is gonna be a very important part of what we do going forward. But the parts have to be in the right place. This is Tyson's Corner, circa a long, long time ago. This is what it became. In fact, Triple A moved out of this place because it became unlivable. And uh, they've got all the parts, but they're in the wrong places, the wrong size, the wrong scale. So I would not refer to this as a city. It is some kind of a settlement, but it's not a city. Not too far away, maybe 30 miles, is Washington, D.C., where one of the greatest planners in the world laid out Washington, D.C., and uh, they got all the same parts, including a few more, but they're in the right places. And I consider Washington, D.C. one of the most walkable cities in the nation. And for every reason, they've done the right things with uh, honoring uh, the right land use. So Washington, D.C. is a city. But think about the form of the housing. And uh, so the housing on the left, which is only eight or 10 dwelling units per acre, is not a place you'd wanna walk. But on the right-hand image, where they paid attention to form, and not much more expensive, maybe a tad, now people wanna walk, because they feel watched over, right? And so getting the form correct is going to be important. Again, getting back to the city, I was able to help design. Uh, we kept the streets narrow. This is actually a one-way, which I generally don't approve of, but in this case, it made a lot of sense. And a build in a park, again, no more than an eighth of a mile. Whatever we build needs to be the right dimensions. I say that 50% uh, of the space should be for people. 
And I count parking as, because it's a buffer or an edge as people's space. And then the other area can be uh, for other uses. This is a connection between the city and the uh, great university, Bristol, England. One of my uh, great opportunities in life is to have had the best mentors. And I'm serious about that. The best mentors in engineering, landscape architecture, architecture, uh, in, in everything. Uh, this is um, Gordon Price, a six-time elected uh, city councilor for Vancouver. And he took us on a walk and had our mobile study tour stand here and he said, what is it you see? And there were, there were tall buildings. There was a lot of density. But then he said, what don't you see? It was cars. Because people can walk. They can bike. They can use transit. And they've got their 15-minute neighborhoods. Very few people get in a car because they know that the parking space that they're going to look for is going to be elusive. So you build your car, your city for people, and you reduce the number of people driving. Uh, they've greatly increased the number of people living in Vancouver, and they've dropped the number of car trips per day. They've proven that density works, and, um, and they've done it well. In fact, uh, what I shared with those on our mobile study tour is uh, as, you, as you team up and ride, stop occasionally and see how many people you see walking, biking, and how many cars you see. There's no place in the city where the cars outnumber the people. And that's, that's a sign that you've actually become uh, one of the most livable cities in the world, Vancouver. I want to uh, share with you one of my favorite authors, Kevin Lynch, who wrote The Image of the City. How many of you have read that book? Okay, that's your homework. Go get a copy and read it. It's a great reading if you're into building cities for people. You have to understand the language. And I'll go through it quickly. Uh, Kevin talks about paths. Paths are streets, they're sidewalks, they're railroad tracks, they're trails, any way you move. And um, then edges. You have to have an edge to uh, the street, to the sidewalk, to anything you build. But then you need districts. The districts are the neighborhoods, and each one has to be unique and distinct. Then nodes, these are the Normally, the places where people come together, cross street, for example, and then the landmarks. And if you do that, you will end up building a great city. Now let's talk about the economics. Two cities I like to use as standout cities, Portland, Oregon. Over a 10-year period, 1980-1990, uh, they focused on designing for people. And uh, they could drop their property taxes 29%. Air pollution uh, came way down, and neighborhood quality went up. Same exact 10 years, Atlanta focused on the car. They have become one of the least healthy places to live, and they've increased their taxes correspondingly, and the quality of their neighborhood has plummeted. They're starting to figure it out now but uh, a lot was lost in that translation. So one of my favorite um, presenters is Joe Minakazi with Urban 3, and he thinks we should be measuring our urban spaces by yield per acre, the same way we rate our farms, right? How much yield are we gonna get per acre? And what he's figured out is again, if you build for people in place, the yield uh, therefore, the return on your investment is going to be much, much higher if you build urban places. I always put, like to put this in as a pop-up test question. If you could buy an acre of Central Park, how much would you have to pay? If you could, you can't. What would you pay? It's in the millions for one acre. Ten million? Higher? Twenty million. Higher? We could do this all day. It's $627 million an acre. That is the value of laying out a city and honoring the places that people want. 
Um, another thing I like to point out is basic economics, that if we could rid ourselves, certainly uh, a city this size, we could do it, of uh, 15,000 cars, another $127 million stays and recirculates in the community. So rather than sending all your, your money to Tokyo or Detroit or wherever, uh, yeah, you still have cars, but you're, you're, you're not destroying your economy because that's all uh, that you work. Also for an individual, um, we've given the wrong emphasis to the right modes. So if you walk and, and the uh, society is gonna help pay for that, it's only a penny for the dollar that you invest in walking. You get clear up to driving, uh, society has to pay $9.20, and many people say that's low for the dollar that you put in. So we're over-subsidizing one mode and, and favoring that over all others. So happiness, uh, referred to as life satisfaction, you see has been flatlined, the dotted line. But I like to point out that there was a peak happiness. It happened in the 60s. This is what it looked like in the 60s. <laughs> this is what that same space, Bryant Park, looks like today. And it was only a couple things that needed to change to make Bryant Park come alive. We need to figure out what brings a place alive and then honor ourselves. For Bryant Park, the, the vast majority of the problem was you couldn't see in or out of the park. So people wouldn't go there unless they were doing something illicit. Um, so think about that. Now, streets for all, and, and there are many different uses of the vocabulary, um, often referred to as complete streets, but let's use the term streets for all, all people, all uses, right? So if we look at the purpose of streets, we want them to be holistic for all, green. We build our design guides for that, and then we get the output. We increase the land value, more maintenance funds now, and streets now pay their way through increased land value. So I like to say it's not just for all users, but all uses, including transit, including emergency response, everything. I also like to say that if we're gonna measure streets for all, again, uh, using the term complete streets, that is not a design. It's really um, following your hearts and figuring out what's missing, what do we put in to make this a place people want to come to and hang out. And uh, that we're not um, focusing on just the safety and the comfort and the accessibility. We're truly focusing on what's the piece of a city give is getting the speeds down to what they should be. No downtown should ever have speeds above 20. No neighborhood should have a local street with speeds above 20. Europe is doing this, they've proven it. Uh, most of Australia, New Zealand, uh, many parts of the world have figured that one out. But we need to do it and make that a principle of the cities that we build here. Gonna play this, this is one of my other favorite discoveries in uh, Salt Lake. We're at 200 west and 300 south in Salt Lake. And this just gives you an example of one of the many uh, treatments that uh, is now being built for the pedestrian and bicyclists, greatly narrowing down the crossing width for the pedestrian, and likewise for the bicyclist, and really slowing down the turning motors. Kudos to all who worked on this project and are preparing them for your communities. Um, again, one of my favorite places is Cool. It's protected, it's well buffered. Uh, the sidewalk is just absolutely dynamite here. Um, likewise, uh, here in the protected intersection, 300 West, I believe is the correct title. This is brand new, you can't even really uh, be on the other side yet, but it's, it's an amazing investment. And I found more beautiful tools being applied Separated biking, walking. You want the walking to be the farthest from the street. And in this case, a nice little 45 degree slope 
uh, so that if the bicycles, for whatever reason, needed to leave, they have a way to, to depart. Um, alleys. I'm a fan of alleys. We need to do better with our alleys and turn those into places. Victoria, British Columbia has done an amazing job with their alleys. They have miles of alleys that are now bringing big money to their cities. Trails, all the things we can do to put eyes on the trails, to have our trails work and, um, and, and to connect. Uh, a city that's really out in the front, not too far from here, is Jackson Hole. Uh, they've done a splendid job. But again, getting back to Salt Lake, uh, I saw this idea in concept in uh, Long Beach over 25 years ago, I believe. And I'm glad to see this tool is now being applied in a, in a modern city in Utah. Target speed, is that a term that everyone here uses? Yeah, okay, so it, it was fairly new as a term 20 years ago. But the idea is uh, to get the speeds down and to set the speed for what the street needs to be able to accomplish. And so the target speed on the above street probably is 45 or 50. Does everybody agree uh, that's? But the one down below, which carries four times as much traffic, is operating somewhere around 25. So it's what elements did you put in? Another city actually did this. Uh, the street you're about to see uh, was five lanes, but this is their downtown, their principal street. They put the parking in the center, which is really good, but now they got the speeds where the average speed is about 12. Um, profound placemaking, wide sidewalks from five lanes down to one in each direction. Another term that uh, often gets mis misapplied is designing our posted speeds for what we call the 85th percentile. We measure what motors are doing and what 85% of them are doing, that's the speed we post. That is totally backwards. Again, target speed should get away from the 85th percentile. And the states and the communities that are figuring this one out are gonna hit the home run. Um, road diets or repurposing of streets. It's uh, my favorite dimension, again, for our lane is 10 feet. And if you need to go higher, go, good, do it. But it's got to be for a good reason. It's a heavy freight movement. It's a um, uh, very heavy used transit corridor. Go up a foot, but start with 10. And you can still have the curb to curb be wider, but use an edge line to denote what speed the motor should be going, right? So if I were to design the street from scratch, this would be my recommendation. Start at the edge. Have a good edge, then your sidewalk, then the planter row, then the bike lane, and then no more than 10 foot wide for your travel lane. That helps hold the speed. Build a triple canopy. Uh, your median uh, takes, takes in uh, the middle ground. So we'll quickly go through. How fast, anyone, do you think motors would go on this street in Chico? What if we added this? What if we add this? What if we add this? Here comes a big one. What if we terminate the Vista, right? And then finally, the engineers and the planners have done enough work that the developers can come in and add this. Now we have a 15 mile per hour street. So you get the right elements in and you can get the right speeds. I like to say less is more. Uh, this is a project we worked on for Safe Routes to School, and this is what we ended up with. Now, these are photomorphs. I uh, haven't been able to get back to every town and photograph what they actually built. But boy, what a difference from building only for cars to building for people and place, right? Chico, uh, again, we take this straight. What's missing, folks? <laughs> You're right. So we build for, for people, and now we not only get people, we get 
buildings that make money. We get streets that behave, right? Uh, this also is a repurposed street. Uh, they didn't have a lot of right of way, but by moving the motors further out, uh, it's at least comfortable for walking. 10 foot lanes, uh, again, can work for every vehicle. This is uh, in Olympia. Taking away lanes that aren't needed. This used to be a three lane street. The uh, pedestrian had to cross over 40 feet and we were able to knock it down to two lanes, uh, a more compact block form or, or intersection form. And now the motors has higher capacity because the pedestrian is disrupting the signal cycle less time. Does this all make sense? Yeah, okay. Uh, so as we build uh, a new intersection, think about what it is we're trying to achieve for the downtown. Now, uh, my final big note is on how do we bring about change? This is the tough part. This is why I got into this trade. I didn't want to master the technical side, although I was schooled very well by folks and was able to do it. But I think the big thing was uh, people were having difficulty getting together. And I went back and I tried to figure out well, what's happening. And this language uh, that you see here, that which cannot be measured either does not exist or is of no value. The affairs of citizens are best guided by experts. Now this room is full of experts, but the real specialists are the people who live in the neighborhood. The people are trying to earn a living. And so we use a process we call informed consent. And at the very top of that process is leading the walking audit. Uh, we'll be doing one more today and uh, Heidi, I'm going to make my presentation on the walking out available to everyone if you can figure out a way to get it up. So what's missing on the street? Anybody? People, number one. Trees. Sidewalk. Buildings. Okay. So the Michigan DOT went in and wanted to build a sidewalk on the side where all the homes are. And the people came out in droves, 300 people came to a meeting to kill the idea of a sidewalk. Because they wanted to look rural. And to them, a sidewalk wouldn't be that. So they lost their sidewalk, but that's the importance of coming up with a good process to get our towns built the way they need to be. Because people have been sadly misinformed and they're working from the wrong assumptions. So to bring about change, I think uh, Bucky uh, Fuller figured it out first, is we have to uh, change the reality. Build model projects. Every project that comes across your desk, make it your great achievement. And by doing that, people are now gonna see it and say, we'd like that in our neighborhood, right? Uh, we, we go out of our way uh, to a place that got built correctly. But the change needs to reward the short trip, not the long trip. As long as we keep focusing on the long trip, we're just gonna build a deeper and deeper cavity to fall into, right? So I always start with a vision. If we can craft a good vision, then we develop the plan from the vision, and uh, then we develop the team that's gonna carry it out. And I'll quickly go through a couple of my favorite projects. I love building at the neighborhood scale. It's where people are ready for a change and it may just start with getting the speeds down. Uh, and again, as a principal, the closer you are to people's homes, the more robust your public engagement must be. This project we powered up in one weekend. Uh, the county said that it would take 10 years to get the project built. The public works director in this town had the bulldozers moving within 300 days. 300 days versus 10 years because of the public process, right? And uh, worked in another town where this road was to be widened just for hurricane evacuation. So I shared a number of tools with everybody and pointed out that keep the right number of lanes, 
build place roundabouts will carry 30 to 50 percent more traffic. And uh, we also built a trail through a, a near wilderness that could be used in a hurricane as an extra route out uh, for that hurricane. So we looked at multiple uses of tools uh, versus just having to widen a road. I'm very proud about this particular community. They used to have five lanes, and uh, they were getting a fair number of crashes. Uh, the bottom two images, uh, you can see, we got it down to one lane in each direction, and they started making buku bucks, measured in the mega, mega, mega millions of dollars. This was the process we used. Many walking audits, uh, many uh, engagement activities to get everybody to understand what was possible to empower the people, and they uh, made what is now considered one of the best remade streets in all of America. Uh, start with pop-up demonstrations. I think you're doing those, right? I think I've seen some already. Seattle has a pavement to parks program. They go into a neighborhood, they work with the neighborhood, identify streets that don't have to carry traffic. After a full year, they further redesign it, but then make it permanent. So think of all the places where you can do that. And uh, again, you can start with paint and uh, some other tools, uh, but for sure, and this, this is why I'm so glad that our uh, Utah folk, design folks, DOT folks, allow me to do it, is to put on the walking audit workshops. We're doing one more today, and uh, they're, they're so powerful. Why do them? They're an amazing media event. Uh, they help people understand how things actually work, and they give you empathy as a designer. And uh, so with that, I'm going to close with one of my favorite people, uh, Bill Murray. Uh, and I want to leave this message that whatever your role is, perhaps it's advocacy, perhaps you're an elected official or, or fortunate enough to be a professional in the field at this time, you're the problem solver. Other generations that came before you, including mine, build it wrong. Uh, you get to correct for that. We live in the most exciting era that I can imagine for the professions or the advocacies that you join. So have fun. Make a difference. Thanks, folks.